Right, thank you. Yes, so I'm Alistair Shannon from uh, the Evolutionary Systems Group over at Keele University. And um, what I'm going to be talking about today is actually an update on the work I talked about two years ago. Um, so looking at uh, uh, indefinite scalability, Dave Apley's idea, uh, within my system, GEB. Uh, so this is a system that first got presented at ECAL 97. It's been going for a long time. Um, it's got definite flaws, and I'll talk about those. Um, but I think it's still uh, able to tell us some interesting things. Uh, so I'll also begin just slightly at the end, because I, I want those of you who listened to the talk two years ago to know what's, that there's something new, and it's worth uh, listening again. Um, so uh, these runs, they take a long time, and it's been two extra years, so that's allowed more runs to complete. And, and that is actually very useful for being able to do some further analysis of, of indefinite scalability. So it's allowed me to push the parameters uh, which I'm running the system up um, higher. Uh, so these were runs that took about three uh, and a bit years in total. Um, and uh, the honest truth is that when I get to my final slides, I don't really 100% know what's going on. But it raises a new interesting question, I think. Uh, something that we're going to have to think about um, beyond maybe just saying, is a system open-ended and is it indefinitely scalable? I think there's a, a practical consideration that this, this work raises. But let me begin back at the beginning. So, uh, what is GEB? Uh, well, actually, it was really nice that Ken Stanley said um, something about the kinds of systems in this area. So, this is a system designed purely to try and uh, look into ideas about open ended evolution. That was what it was from the beginning. It's not designed to look good. It's really, um, it has a number of ingredients, which I'll run through very quickly. But it was an attempt at an almost minimal version of what I thought at the time would be necessary for an open ended evolutionary system. Um, so uh, the agents, there are agents, um, and they're drawn as triangles. And I, I was reluctant about that. I, I didn't really even want them to have position, but I'll come back to that. I think um, I made a major mistake there, and that's probably the weak, biggest weakness in the system. But let me just describe it first. Each agent is a little triangle, and it can move around. It's um, got, they've got um, genotypes that map to developmental systems, uh, that produce neurocontrollers, that produce behavior. The, um, Parameters of the evolution are set up a bit like uh, Imran Harvey's saga. Uh, so this work actually began in a master's project in Sussex and then a PhD at Southampton University in the UK. Um, and so that was, you know, the paradigm is uh, mostly converged species. There's normally only, uh, at least in the smaller worlds, only one or a few uh, species in there at any one time. Uh, I wanted to obviously get co-evolutionary feedback. And, and the really key thing about this system is that uh, all selection uh, is biotic. So I explicitly try to remove any form of abiotic selection. So uh, everyone tries to leave is the intrinsic thing in their system that they believe is the requirement that will lead to the hallmark of, of, of well, one of the hallmarks of open-end evolution. So I'm after probably the simplest hallmarks of open-end evolution. So I'm, I'm not particularly after major transitions uh, at the moment. I, I'm trying to do the first thing first, and, and then I would be interested in opening up and making intrinsic the things that are currently extrinsic. So, for example, replication in this system is just some code that, that does replication. Uh, I, I'm not saying at all I'm not interested in, in trying to free that up, but I'm trying to do the simple first thing first, which to me is to get just a system uh, with, if I go back to uh, what, we, what came out of um, the, uh, the first workshop, I just wanted a simple system with ongoing adaptive novelty and of the simplest kind uh, and ongoing growth of complexity. Uh, and I, I'm not yet investigating things like major transitions. Um, so there's a number of things in here that are, are extrinsic, but I still think we can aim for open-ended evolution within such a system. Um, so biotic selection is the key feature that differentiates this from, from a lot of other systems that might superficially look like it. Uh, so that is the idea that um, the behaviors in the environment are the result of the, the controllers that are a result of what's being evolved. So the behavior is evolved, that changes what it is to be fit in the environment, and you get a feedback loop, and that is what I believe would be the, the thing to drive this most basic form of, of open-ended evolution. And there's lots, lots of details in, uh, that's probably the, if you're going to read one paper, then that, that paper would be the one to read. Uh, so uh, the, there are newer controllers with um, McCulloch pits neurons with two channels. Uh, Every genome gets decoded to some production rules with a Lindemar system that grows the neurocontroller. Uh, I'll, that's slightly important because I'll, I'll talk about each of the rules that gets decoded off the genotype as a gene, just as a shorthand for a little bit of genetic material that gets read 
the genotype is read from every single position, and then the roles are decoded. And then uh, the system um, uses those rules to develop the neurocontroller. So some rules will actually be used for neural development, and some won't. Uh, and we'll come back to that in a bit. So when you run this system, it produces all sorts of little behaviors, some simple behaviors early in evolution. Uh, things chase each other around. Uh, they decide to reproduce with things that are like them. They kill things that are not like them. Uh, they come up with nice strategies of sharing activation with, with other members of the species. Um, and with very fast reactions can exist within a space where more complicated organisms are existing uh, just because they, they can do things slightly faster but simpler behaviors. Uh, but after a while, it gets really hard to tell what's going on. And that's where the, the system's major failing is. So just to go back, you can watch triangles running around on the screen for a while, and while the behaviors are simple, you can maybe guess when to click on them and when to have a look at the neurocontrollers and see if what's happening. Once you get much further into evolution, just watching triangles on the screen is, is really quite useless. Um, and so although I do make some kind of claim for having passed an A test, and we'll get to that in a moment, on open-end evolution, I still think it's fair to say that we haven't seen open-end evolution in the system, because I can't show you the behaviors. Because it's so visually simple, and I think that's one of the major take-home lessons that I've learned, is that um, really, in the short term, it would be nice to create a system where we can see uh, evolved behaviors and a nice chain of co-evolved behaviors from a, a biotic selection system. Uh, let me get back to where I was. So, um, around about that time, thankfully, Mark Beddow and Norma Picard were coming up with their uh, evolutionary activity statistics, um, and they're, they're really elegant. So I expect most people uh, know about them, so I won't go on about them for too long, uh, but they can be uh, applied to any system, and they help you visualize uh, what's going on with the components within your system. In my system, I, I use a gene as a component. Um, and they're based on really simple things. So does a component exist at a time or not? And then adding up over time steps whether or not that exists. And that alone is enough for you to visualize a little bit about what's going on inside your system. So this is from one of my systems uh, late on in evolution and just with the low activity components. On the left is from a real run and then from the right is a shadow. So where a shadow is um, uh, you know, the same system but where selection is completely random. Uh, and uh, you see in the real run uh, components being kept around, reused, while you see uh, more of a kind of drift-like process with some components just hanging around. And it's, it's those uh, two systems that you then compare to see uh, whether or not you've got uh, the hallmarks, uh, well, perhaps that's the wrong word, the, met, uh, the combination of metrics uh, producing the right outcome to say that it's, uh, maybe the system is open-ended or not. Uh, I did make one contribution to statistics, so I came up with a way of normalizing using a reset mechanism um, to be able to produce a normalized version of these statistics, and uh, that was crucial uh, in being able to not being able to cheat in simple terms. So uh, with the regular statistics, it's possible to cheat and come up with systems that, that give you the kind of combination of metrics that we think uh, was appropriate for some kind of open end evolution. Um, or unbounded uh, evolutionary activity. Um, these are necessary, and it was a nice paper by uh, Lee, uh, Andrew Stout and Lee Spector demonstrating uh, the, the importance of this approach. So if you, if you ever get to a point where you're, you've been using the original metrics and, and you've done very well, uh, try these ones. They're tougher, um, and uh, it's nice. Uh, so, but the essential thing really is that once you plot some of the higher level metrics from those, uh, there's a signature uh, that says, okay, uh, maybe you're in a class of unbounded evolutionary activity. Uh, this has got the original uh, class numbers. I think that they were changed a bit later, but essentially the class is the same. Uh, so uh, the basic idea for this class three, as it is here, is that you continually have new activity, so um, new components coming into the system, and that uh, in some way the total amount of activity builds up in the system uh, is unbounded. So that can be from having unbounded acti uh, average activity of a component or from having unbounded diversity. Now, um, the one thing to say is I, I think, um, maybe I was shy about saying it originally, but the idea that you can actually have unbounded diversity in a system, even in nature, is, is perhaps a, a little bit of a hand wavy thing, right? So we know that, that even nature is bounded. You, you couldn't, uh, there's a limited number of atoms in the universe, um, even. Uh, you know, uh, arguments about antimatter and so on aside, uh, it, there's an effective upper bound. So what really I think was meant at the time by unbounded diversity was that effectively diversity was unbounded. And that's, that's a little bit challenging for our, um, our computer systems, for example, 
um, and uh, we can improve that. There is, however, something I think it's really worth the community keeping these things in mind, because this was uh, uh, around about the late um, 1990s. What these statistics did is they produced a classification system that showed the fossil record, or two fossil records if I remember right, Enel, um, were classified as one class and every other system was classified, uh, although all our artificial systems were classified as not of that class. So just from an empirical point of view, they separated it out and said, look, aha, there's something different about nature from what you've got. And I think this, this uh, set of metrics is a bit like um, uh, how our systems are. They're, they're there to test um, our ideas, and it's not necessarily the end result. It might be that this would need to be updated at some point. We might have a system that, that achieves a certain classification, but we don't like. It's, it's got something wrong with it, and then maybe we change the classification system to, to take account of it. Um, Norman could say if he, he thinks that's wrong. But, uh, so, um, I just wanted to, to interject with something about diversity and complexity, because so in the, in the work here today, I'm going to be using a measure of individual complexity. That is the diversity of ad adaptive components in the individual. So in my system, that's the number of active genes. So that's, that's the genes that are involved in neural development. So not all genes are, uh, but those that actually are involved and actually do something that makes a difference, um, we can count them up and uh, use that as a complexity measure. Uh, biologists do seem to do this, they, they, uh, they count genes. Um, you could do all sorts of clever tricks, uh, you could look at the information content within it. Uh, but I think there's also a general principle here, that in general diversity and complexity are uh, somewhat the same thing. So the complexity of one system could be uh, measured by the diversity of the things inside it, at whatever level, and you can, you can go through a hierarchy like that. And all the tricks that you might like to perform on diversity are the same kind of tricks that you would like to perform on complexity. Uh, and I think that that insight, for me at least, um, when we sometimes worry about whether we're talking about diversity or complexity, maybe actually they can be seen as two, the same thing, just at different levels in a, in a hierarchy. Okay, uh, I'll flick through just to keep going. So that, that business of diversity being unbounded, and I said before that that was maybe a rather uh, hand wavy thing and maybe what was meant is practically unbounded. So indefinite scalability, Dave Ackley's idea, uh, comes to our rescue here, I think. It's a way of saying something just a little bit more concrete than unbounded diversity. So we can ask um, whether complexity uh, goes up when we increase the parameters in our system that are stopping it from going up uh, in, in very simple terms. So uh, I'm just going to go a little bit faster. So in my system, I, I have two parameters that are in there to make the system able to run in finite time and you know, to get, to get results within you know, just years. Uh, the number of neurons has a fixed upper limit, um, and the world size, which corresponds to the population size, also has a fixed upper limit. So both of these relate to how long it takes a, a simulation to run and how much memory is needed. So first of all, you can increase the maximum number of neurons allowed for any one individual uh, with, while keeping the world size constant, and what you find is that you reach an upper limit. So there comes a point for any particular world size where it's no longer beneficial, it's not producing any um, more uh, adaptive genes, um, essentially because, well, my, the intuition is because the, the size of the brains um, are large enough to deal with a, a world of that, of that size. And you can present exactly the same curves, um, but grouped differently to imagine that you're instead um, increasing the world size while keeping the maximum number of neurons constant. Uh, so here we are. Um, uh, maybe you just have 20 neurons and you can go for bigger and bigger worlds and again you find that the complexity appears to be uh, bounded asymptotically as you go up. The interesting, and again that makes sense, right? But So the interesting thing comes if you increase the two together. So now you're increasing what it is the agents should be able to do because they've got more neural capacity and you're increasing the space in which they could do things so that there's maybe more challenges that they impose on each other as they evolve. And at that point, um, we begin to see some indication that maybe this system is uh, uh, continuing to scale. Um, and so I think two years ago I was able to show this graph with the extra data, we can now begin to do something a bit more interesting and uh, collapse these down and look at how uh, as, as we increase scale, uh, what that now looks like um, across all the simulations. So essentially what I do is I average um, across just the last million time steps and across 20 runs for, it for each, uh, each treatment. 
and you get this, uh, which I was quite excited when I saw it. Um, uh, so uh, there's, some, there's some caveats about ignoring edge, uh, edge effects. Um, uh, the whole system works a bit differently with very small number of neurons. Uh, essentially, it doesn't really even work like a neurocontroller. It's continually re retasking neurons and, um, so that it can, it can do complex behaviors with very small number of neurons. Once you get away from those kind of edge effects, uh, it does look like every time you double the scale of both the number of neurons and the world size at a time, you get a linear increase in the complexity of, of, uh, of the number of genes, essentially, that, that evolve. And, and that's quite a nice result. And at first I was just really happy about that. Uh, and then I realized, um, well, uh, it's, it's got nice uh, coefficients of determination, but maybe I could just do better. So I had in mind that I'd just tweak um, the power of the complexity a tiny bit. And I had in mind that I might go for 0.99, uh, or, or raise it to the power of 1.01, or something like that. And then a really strange thing happened um, that I'm still trying to get my head around. Um, and maybe someone who's really good at dealing with distributions of numbers could, could help me understand this. Uh, you can raise this complexity to uh, really high powers, all the way up to four seems to be about right. Um, and you can still get this linear relationship. Now this is completely counterintuitive. I think it has to do with something to do with the uh, distribution of the maximum complexities that allow this to happen. Uh, but I've spent a number of sleepless nights trying to get my head around it, and it's still a work in progress. In a way, I don't think that's, that's something I, I'm going to have to go away and, and solve, but it raises a really interesting question, right? So at this point, you might say, hurrah, right? We've got a system that passes like Beto Picard, uh, what we once called the A-Life test, uh, that looks like it's indefinitely scalable. But if this power is wrong, then it's going to be awful for actually trying to get to really significant complexity levels. So if it was the case, that individual complexity to the power of four scales linearly, um, then we're never going to get anywhere too interesting. Um, so I think that there's, um, this is beginning to give something about the order of indefinite scalability, which is a concept I'd not really thought about before. I came across it by accident. But just because you're indefinitely scalable doesn't mean that as you scale that you're going to reach, um, in a nice way, increasing levels of complexity. If that scales you know, to the power of one over five, um, then good luck getting to anything like the complexity of nature. Uh, I don't really know what the answer is in my system, but it, it has at least raised a, a really interesting question, I think. Uh, so just in conclusion, um, I've used um, uh, a measure of individual complexity based on diversity, so just the number of um, uh, adaptively significant genes. Um, use that to look at how uh, how the system scales as you increase the parameters that are limiting it, so um, the, essentially the number of neurons and the world size, which is the, the population size, um, and found that it looks like it's indefinitely scalable. I think we should begin to qualify these things, right? Because we're not, I, I wrote more about it in, in, the, in the extended abstract, but um, we're not really able to test whether something's indefinitely scalable. We're, we're able to test whether it scales as far as we've tested it. And I think those qualifications are important. Uh, so this system has billions of reproductions and population sizes in the hundreds or thousands. Um, and that's, that's quite an important caveat, um, but if I can just uh, go back. What that means is that I've seen, I'm not going to name names, but I've seen some systems here today uh, which are pretty much equivalent in how much evolution has taken place. And I've seen some systems here today where if you were to plot their evolution, it, it kind of is on the left few pixels of this graph. And I think that we should begin to qualify quite carefully, like to what scalability have, have we gone? Um, and that's, um, so in this system, it's, it's sort of billions of um, reproductions, uh, run times their years, that's perhaps not so significant. Um, and, that, uh, and so there's some good indication to think that scaling, but it's raised this crucial question, if, is what is the order of indefinite scalability? Uh, how is it scaling? And would that lead to uh, it's interesting complexity within a, a lifetime, for example? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alistair. Very punctual. Questions? I've got a question. Um, just so, so curious, in some of your graphs of fitness, um, at some levels, it seemed like the complexity peaked very early on and then declined slightly. Oh, uh, so, uh, yes, so that is... Um, Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not the only one uh, to, let me try and find one that's like that, um, there's a whole load. And in fact, um, so yes, um, it tends to happen with a really small number of neurons, um, which is why you see it a lot in these graphs. 
Others have found the same thing. So some of Larry Yeager's work he found it. Um, so what you have is, because you're starting with, you know, in, in mind you start with nothing, but it, it's about as bad as starting with random. Um, evolution just does something at first, and then it kind of optimizes those things down. Um, so it produces some unnecessary uh, structures. And when you've got five neurons, that's actually, um, you know, uh, something that can then be got rid of later. Um, it doesn't seem to happen in my system once you have a sensible number of neurons and where the neurocontrollers are behaving uh, rather like you would expect neural controllers to behave. Um, uh, yeah. And so, so maybe I'll give a better answer than that, actually. So uh, I, I'm concerned, uh, let's say, take this graph. I'm concerned whether the lead signs keep going up. All of that confusion is over on the left, where I don't, I don't really care. I, I'm concerned in that direction. Yeah. Other questions? Ken. Hey, yeah, nice study. Um, so really interesting results and, and something to think about. Um, I was wondering if you have, um, or if there's any concern about the measure of complexity. Like, I actually hate arguing about what complexity is, but just to think about it for a second, like the, because um, I think it's the size of the networks you're getting. Is that actually capturing the, the issue that, that it, this scalability is supposed to be capturing? You know, like the true complexity of the behaviors or something like that? Uh, yeah, so I have thought about it a fair bit. It's, it's not great. Uh, it's not perfect at all. It's the best I can come up with. Um, I think that there would be really good arguments for looking at the information content of uh, the genes rather than just counting them. Um, that's highly problematic, of course. I mean, I, I've considered using things like compression measures or something like that. I, I definitely don't believe, even though I'm using a diversity measure, you'd, you'd have thought that something like you know, Shannon entropy might be a good way to go, but you know, that's maximized by, by random or, or a uniform distribution. So. Um, I think I could try uh, using things that look at the information content, and maybe that would be an improvement. In particular, I think there's a danger that you could do all of this with another system and you could cheat. So I could, you could probably design a system that if you're just counting genes, that you cheat on and you, you get something that's not real. Uh, I'm rather trusting myself that I haven't cheated um, a little bit. Uh, and I think that if we were to come up with a robust way of doing this across systems, we'd have to get something in there that was probably looking at information content of genes rather than just, just counting them. Yeah, it, but I just to add that this is something we all face. I mean, whoever is experimenting in this area, it's like it's not just the system. It's like I don't know what to do either. Like to really be sure that complexity went up um, in, in like a fundamental way. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so I'm curious because you're using the maximum individual complexity as you change the size of the population, just the statistics of, say, a randomly generated population should not have a constant complexity as you increase that, right? Because uh, of extreme value statistics. Right. Um, How does this so, scaling compare with that? So there is, the, so this, I guess this goes back to, I forget who covered it here, but this goes back to the old argument about could maximum complexity be driven by drift with, with a hard barrier, so Gould's, Gould's argument. Um, uh, just empirically, I don't think it is. So if you plot the distributions of, of uh, complexity, they're not up against a hard barrier. Uh, so they are in the very tiny worlds and the very tiny number of neurons, but they're roughly normally distributed uh, well away from the barrier of zero. Right, uh, but like if, you, if you normally distribute and then take the max, then that actually is dependent on population size. And if it's logarithmically dependent on population size, then that fully explains these curves with no evolution. So I'm wondering, like, if you turn evolution off, do you, can you show that you don't get the scaling? That's something I could do with the shadow, actually. So I could check that the, 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 that doesn't exhibit this yeah. property. Um, thank you, that's a good idea. Yeah. Other questions? I, okay. Um, uh, sort of a follow-on to Ken's question. Um, I'm wondering if you, um, besides uh, collecting the statistics, if you um, tried to you know, after it's been evolving for some god ungodly number of time steps, um, actually take a look in and see if there's any funny interactions going on. Like maybe there's some kind of, instead of just looking at the complexity of individuals, maybe um, if there's some kind of indirect interactions going on uh, that could uh, start to form ecological effects that you could figure out some way of tagging with, with statistics that aren't just looking at the, um, the individuals. Yeah. So um, uh, <laughs> I tried doing this back in the late 90s um, with the original system, and I spent weeks sitting in front of monitors trying to look for interesting papers. 
then clicking on them and then examining the neurocontrollers and trying to explain how those behaviors work. And later on in evolution, it just becomes incredibly hard to do. Um, there is something that I came up with useful a few years later from your statistics, actually. So when, when new components become adaptively significant, so in the original statistics, when they cross that, that threshold, um, that gives some, a prompt to say that there might be something interesting here. But, it, but later on in evolution, even then, the neurocontrollers are, are really complex things. Um, I, I believe that I've been told that there have been methods in um, uh, analyzing neurocontrollers that have come about in the last decade that, that can help to automatically analyze how neurocontrollers work. I, I haven't looked into those yet. Uh, but certainly on the behavioral side, which is where I've always imagined looking, it's, it's just triangles and, and it's really hard to, once they're just rushing around like crazy, it, it's really hard to know what they're doing. Thank you, Alistair.